In this tutorial, we're going to cover how to troubleshoot pilot simulations uh, using a 2D example. And in this case, what we're doing is I've introduced a number of errors into the parameter files, both the .cfg files as well as spatial databases. And we're going to see, uh, we're going to try and run the simulations. We're going to see what the errors are, and we'll go through how to fix those errors. But first, let's take a step back and uh, dive a little bit deeper into how to understand uh, the pilot parameters and how they're set up and how to interrogate what the parameters are being used in the simulation. So there's a number of ways to find out what parameters are available. Uh, the components are, the, are also called facilities and they're the building blocks of the simulation, they're the different objects that have various properties that have subcomponents and which have subcomponents themselves and so forth. There is a complete list of those components in the uh, pilot manual and the user guide under the prior component section. It lists all the components grouped by whether they're boundary conditions, um, materials, and so forth. And so some examples of those are for a problem, uh, we have a time dependent component. We also have a Green's function component. Boundary conditions, we have Dirichlet time dependent and Neumann time dependent. Faults, we have fault cohesive kin and fault cohesive impulses. Materials, we have elasticity, poor elasticity, incompressible elasticity. For solution observers, we have output solution domain, output solution boundary, output solution points. Our mesh importers, we have mesh IO qubit, mesh IO petsy, mesh IO. Uh, ASCII. And then uh, in addition to having uh, objects as our components, we also have properties. And these are the basic types, such as just a string, for example, a file name, an integer value, a floating point value, uh, a dimension quantity, and uh, arrays of strings, integers, or floats uh, here uh, given as a, a list of uh, integers. The parameter files have the basic syntax of a header, which gives the uh, name of the component in the tree. And then you can assign subcomponents as well as uh, parameter values, just uh, with the name of the component equals objects, parameter equals value. So you've seen these examples throughout our parameter files. Here we're setting an array of boundary conditions. We give the name uh, in our array, and then we can refer to that name below, and we give it the name of the component. And when you look through the, the entire component section of the manual, you'll see the full name, and that's the name you would give uh, here. Uh, then we can refer to that component again. So we walk down the tree. So here we had pilot.problem. Here we have pilot.problem.bc. X positive, so we're walking down the tree a little further. We're uh, to that object. So for the Dirichlet time dependent component, we now have uh, all of its properties and components. So it has a property for constrained degree of freedom for the label that's a string, and uh, for various objects such as the auxiliary field database and its components and so forth. To get a better idea of the component hierarchy, uh, there's two ways. Within the binary package, we bundled in the parameters GUI, and you can run it by running uh, this uh, command line. Alternatively, you can uh, load in your browser, uh, point it to uh, geodynamics.github.io slash pile of parameters. And that'll bring up uh, this web page where you can choose a file to load parameters. You can reload them if, the, if that file has changed. And these are the parameters that are dumped out. This is the JSON file from either running the pilot underscore dump parameters or running a pilot simulation and looking at the parameters.json file. And we'll show an example of this in just a minute. Uh, so here I can I show an example of generating that uh, parameter file. So let's bring that up. 
And so let's bounce over to the box 2D directory. And we will run this command. We will run pilot dump parameters step 0t02 shear diff stop shear CFG. And you will see that it created by default a pilot underscore parameters.json file, which we can then load up in our web browser. So I have to navigate to a file. There it is. I can open it up and boom, it loads up. First, I usually collapse the entire hierarchy. Let's first look at the version information. So this, when you run a simulation it, when you're within the JSON parameter file, it, it spits out all the information in terms of uh, what version of pilot you're running, uh, the Git information, what version of Petsy, MPI, all of the dependencies that we have information about in terms of the version information. Uh, and then on the parameters, as we go back to collapse all, we start at the application level. We can uh, open things up. And so we can look at our mesh generator. We can look at our reader. And if we click on the red area, you can see the parameters over here. You can choose to show the description or sh not show the location. Uh, so this is a in this case, my coordinate system you can see is a uh, Cartesian coordinate system and that I've set the spatial dimension and I set the spatial dimension at line 37 of pilotapp.cfg. Uh, if I go down here under problem, I can see my boundary conditions. I can see what type they are. I can see what the constrained degrees of freedom are. I can see all of the default values um, for my solution. I can see uh, what type of solution it is. I see here that it's a solution displacement object. So that means I'm just doing regular elasticity, no fault. Um, and I can see all of my output from my observers, in this case, just the domain. So you can walk down all of these uh, and you can get information about uh, exactly the description and so forth and what values are set, where they're coming from, and the default values. So we'll come back to that in our debugging. Uh, you can also, uh, uh, within the, the GUI interface, uh, I'm sorry, within the binary package, as I mentioned before, you can just cd to this directory and start it up. That'll run a, web, a simple web browser uh, on your local web server on your local host. Um, or you can use uh, the URL if you're online and then just load the parameter file. Um, you can also get information from the command line. So there's dash dash help and dash dash help that components and help properties. So let's uh, take a look at that. Let's load up our uh, terminal here and oops. And we will run this command. So we're gonna run uh, step, oops. So here, just CFT, we're gonna do, we don't need to start out with pilot app. We can start out with problem, boundary condition, boundary condition one negative dot help. And it spits out a list of the properties and a list of the facilities. To get information about the properties, we just add more properties. And you see there's all of the properties for this particular component. Uh, and you can see what the current value is, where it came from, just like what we saw. This is the exact same information that's shown in the, captured in the, uh, the JSON file. And if we do help dash components,
you can get the same information um, well, just now for the components and you can walk down those further. So if I, if I see the component that I want, I want the database auxiliary field. I can look at its components. So I can keep walking down the tree. Obviously it's a little bit easier if you just uh, load up the JSON file. Oops, I must have spelled something wrong because it just kept going. So help components, that's what you see, help properties. And uh, so you can see we have this nice web-based browser for the parameters. Uh, you may be asking, well, why don't we have a graphical user interface for editing those parameters? Um, that's, uh, so that's been on our wish list, but it's gonna require time uh, or a developer to step in and be able to fulfill that functionality. It's not nearly as easy to edit parameters, especially when you need to validate them as it is to just view um, these components. Um, if the user provides the name of the component, then it won't be too difficult. And that's something that we may be looking into in the next few years. Um, but to see all the possible choices for components, uh, this is, needs to be done dynamically and at runtime, so it's much more difficult. Um, and we, of course, we would want to provide basic validation of parameters using our built-in validation functionality. Um, and uh, if we did have an editor, we would like to export parameters to a single file. Um, and that facilitates archiving the parameters that are used in a given simulation. So now we'll switch gears and we'll actually look at how to do some troubleshooting of uh, simulations. And we're gonna look at, um, our examples are gonna be in the troubleshooting-2D directory. And uh, we're gonna look at two steps in the reverse 2D uh, example, both step one and step six. So just a reminder, step one is just gravity uh, on this rectangular domain with lower boundary conditions. And so let's bring back our, our terminal and let's try and run this simulation. So we'll go to troubleshooting 2D uh, and we'll try and run pilot step zero one. And we get an error and you'll see we scroll back up to the top. It's a long list of error messages. We get a, a trace back that starts way up at applications. It goes down all through. And you'll see finally down here, the one of the last components I'm in is in my Dirichlet time dependent boundary condition. It's at line 120. It's in a validate function and it raises this error. And the error message I get is no constrained degrees of freedom found for time dependent Dirichlet boundary condition BCX positive, constrained degree of freedom must be a zero-based integer array where zero equals X, one equals Y, and two equals C. So I know that I have an error in my boundary condition BCX positive. So let's pull up our uh, file. If I look at step zero one gravity, I don't have my boundary condition in there. It's actually in my pile of app file. So let's scroll down to, I'll bump this up a little bigger. Boundary conditions, here's my BCX positive. There's BCX positive. Uh, here's BCX positive. And look, I this is it, called it here just X positive rather than BCX positive. So that would explain why it didn't have any information about my uh, boundary condition because I had used the wrong name here uh, that didn't match what I'd used up here. So let's see, we save that. So let's run it again. Okay, and what do we see? Well. Let's start up here at the top. Now we're getting uh, configuration errors. It says I'm in my a default 
I'm in time dependent problem defaults name, missing required property name in default options for problem. So if I go to my, this is within my problem. So let's look at step zero on gravity. And here I am at sort of my top level. And uh, let's load up. Uh, the easiest way I think is to let's look at what, um, so I'm within problem defaults. So let's go uh, time dependent dot help properties. So I have solver formulation, uh, I need, it's not properties, it's a component. Uh, so here's my list of components. Let's see, where is, it's telling me I had help components. There we are, help components. Progress monitor defaults. So I need to go to defaults. Now I can do help properties. And here's my default value. Oh, I don't have a default value for my output. Um, well, the default value was empty string. And my, so the current value is empty string, the default is empty string. And so um, there's a validator that says it must not be empty. So I need to assign a name to my simulation. So I can here, I can do uh, I'm in problem, defaults, name equals step zero one, gravity. So uh, let me just check to make sure we went through that one. We fixed that and problem underscore defaults dot name equals step zero one gravity. Oops. Uh, so let's see. Depends on how exactly how I define it, but I think let's. We can check to make sure we have it now. So now if we run it, let's see. There we are. Now we see that the current value is step zero one underscore gravity. And so we can try and continue. Oh, still another error. Okay, now I am given, instead of sort of having a default information there, now it says pilothapp.cfg line 133, unknown component pilothapp time dependent materials, elasticity, auxiliary subfields, bulk logics. Um, so this is a little bit trickier one, um, but let's start by looking at line 133 of pilothapp.cfg. So if I scroll up, here's line 133. It gives me uh, auxiliary subfields, bulk modulus, uh, basis order zero. Um, so I don't see anything immediately obvious wrong here. But what we can do is this is an isotropic linear elastic material. Let's look in our parameter files. So let's choose to load up, let's go to back up to examples. Let's go to troubleshooting 2D. Um, I'm gonna have to cancel. I need to dump my parameter file. So let's go over here. And instead of running pilot, let's run dump parameters. So it's not even gonna try. Uh, Let's see, did it generate the file? No, it doesn't even generate the file because it doesn't pass validation. So I'm going to have to use a different 
uh, approach here um, because I can't even see my dump my parameters. So, but we can walk down the hierarchy again. Um, but before I do that, let's show, let's go to the pilot manual, user guide, pilot components. Let's go down to materials. Let's look at elasticity. We're in elasticity. It has auxiliary subfields. Um, and uh, so it's auxiliary subfields. Let's see, auxiliary subfields, uh, elasticity. So auxiliary, auxiliary subfield elasticity has body force, density, and gravitational acceleration. Our error message is related to bulk modulus. So that's not even in our subfield for elasticity. That's in, uh, let's see, linear isotropic elasticity. There it is. So it's in the rheology. It's not in the material. So what we need to do is we need to, uh, let's go back to line 130. So, oops. 133. So we are in, let's scroll up. Where's my, here's my heading. So problem materials wedge. Let's walk down problem materials wedge and database auxiliary. Auxiliary field help components. Uh, so that's one level to low. Within my wedge, I have a bulk rheology. So that's where I expect in my information to be. Uh, and I have auxiliary subfields. So there's bulk modulus. So my bulk modulus is in, under, is in the bulk rheology. So let's go back here and uh, here's the, Here's the pre other material. So you'll see that I am missing for my both my bulk modulus and shear modulus. They need to be prefixed with the bulk rheology. They're in the bulk rheology, they're not in the materials. This is a little bit of a tricky one. Um, but you can see you need to you can interrogate using the command line uh, what components are in and what pieces uh, and try and uncover where you might uh, have this error. So let's go back up and run uh, step zero one again. Okay, we made it substantially farther. We started, we got through all the configuration. Now we're in the, um, trying to do the verify compatibility of problem configuration. So still some more validation. And uh, so we had sort of standard output coming up. You can see that the, we started first indication of an error is here. We go to traceback, coming down here, runtime error. So here's the error, material label value three for cell does not match any of the label value, does not, does not match the label value of any materials or interfaces. So within here, I think our materials are in the pilot app, here we are. So we have slab, crust, and wedge for our materials. We have a label value of zero, label value of one, label value of two. Um, these need to match what's up what is in the mesh generation file. So in this case, I'm using this gmesh file. So let's 
load it into GMesh. And let's see if we can turn on visibility uh, of entities. And here you can see, ah, my materials are one, two, and three. Not zero, one, and two. They're one, two, and three. So if I come back to my pilot app file, let's see my slab. Let's uh, so my slab is one, my crust is two, my wedge is three. So I think I'm just off by my slab is one, my crust is two, and my wedge is three. So we can exit. Out of GMesh. Let's go back. And now we can run again. Uh, another error. Let's see. So in this case, we're getting in a Pepsi reported error. So uh, it appears. The error is generally on the top, and then there's auxiliary information. Uh, I'm going to focus on this right here. Uh, it said it had an error in an external library. Error, here's the error message. Error converting spatial data values for gravitational acceleration at location at some points in spatial database gravity field found near zero magnitude, which is actually given a zero for gravity field uh, vector zero, zero. So I have a zero, zero gravity field. Um, I'm in 2D. And so I need to look at my gravity field settings. And you'll notice that here, uh, it gives the stack trace within the Petsy and ends that it was uh, within Pilot and the field query uh, information. Um, that's it's mainly we can focus on just uh, this information up here. So we need to look at our gravity field. Um, let's see, did we get uh, so on parameters? And that was uh, a current updated file. So let's look at our parameter file now that we have one. So we can look at, um, we need to go to the troubleshooting directory in the output directory, step zero one needed. Get a little bit wider here. Step zero one, pilot parameters. Open that up. So let's see. Let's collapse everything. So we're going, we're looking for a problem. We're looking for gravity field. We can click on gravity field. Um, we're in steps, here it is, step 01, that's CFG line 59. Here's our acceleration, that looks good. Description, gravity field, gravity direction, zero, zero, minus one. And it's from the default. So the default is for 3D going in the minus C direction. We have a 2D problem. We want to be in the minus y direction. So we need to change the default value from being in 0, 0, minus 1 to being 0, minus 1, 0. Um, so we can find out where we are. Let's look at line 59 of pilotapp.cfg. Whoops, I keep going there. Let's scroll up to line 59. Uh, oh, step zero one, sorry, wrong file. Line 59, here's my gravity field. So I just need to say gravity field. What is it? Gravity direction. Oops, sorry about that. Direction equals zero minus one, zero. And we'll just make it obvious that these are floating values. 
Point values, okay. So we think we fixed that one. Let's run again. We've gone all the way up to initializing the problem. Starting the solve. We converged. And it's finished. So we ran all the way through without errors, but you never know. Let's check to make sure that everything looks correct. So let's bring in ParaView and view the simulation. Let's run and look at the displacement. Uh, whoops, that's not the output directory. I want the viz directory, plot displacement warp. Starting with the Python shell, I need to change my warp scale. You'll see it's gravity, so it's created a huge Information factor of five is generally good. Let's zoom in. Ah, uh, there we go. So, uh, oops, let's on Z, zoom in, uh, get our 2D, and then we can translate. There we go. So we have just subsidence due to the fact that we turned on gravity. We have no uh, initial stresses, so uh, gravitational forces forces cause um, large subsidence of 1.8 kilometers. And this is the correct solution. If we compare it to reverse 2D gravity zero one, this is the solution we get. So we fixed all of our errors in that problem. And you can see how we walk through. We use a combination of looking at directly at our parameter files. We look at are uh, using the parameter viewer. We, if, we have, if we get far enough along in the, in the configuration that that gets dumped out, we can start looking at that. Um, but a lot of it is just uh, sort of step-by-step step going through the error message, identifying the error, where the error message is um, in all of the output and uh, trying to use as much information as provided to uh, zero in on where the error is. Okay, so that, uh, let's go back to our slides. Um, we've walked through all of these errors. Um, these are sort of for reference, uh, identifying what those errors are. Uh, these are all the resolutions and where we edited. There's our solution uh, matching uh, what I just showed. So now let's look at another case. Now we're going to switch to uh, one that includes faults that has uh, uh, we some of the same types of errors, but also this one is a little more complicated uh, in terms of now uh, we have a spatial database controlling the slip on the fault. Um, this is a slight deviation from step 06 that used uniform slip. Um, and uh, in, in the reverse 2D, we called it step 06 two faults elastic. Here I've just shortened the name uh, just to make it easier for referring to it. So let's run this problem. So we can run step 06 to faults, jump in, and what do you know? We get errors. Um, OK, so let's start off with the very top level. Uh, there's some default value that it's complaining about. Time-dependent interfaces, fault cohesive kin, single rupture, kinematic source steps, simple DB description, is empty description for spatial database not specified. So we know this is the spatial database for our kinematic source within our fault. So we need to look at our step instead of step 01, we need to look at step 06. We need to find our fault. Uh, it was our kinematic source rupture. So here's our fault. Here's our rupture. We're looking at, uh, let's see, we have a splay and a fault. So we got to make sure we're, make, we're in the fault and not in the splay. So database uh, description, 
So I don't see a database description. I see one down here. So it means it's complaining we don't have one. So we'll say fault rupture for main fault. And so that looks consistent with what we have down there. Uh, so let's keep going. Here, let me clear up my screen, run it again so we can get a better view. Another default error, file name for spatial database not specified, kinematic source, simple DB, simple IO, ASCII file name. Um, let's see. We also here at line 68, it says an unrecognized file name. So let's look at line 68 and see. So here's my file name. It's assigned to the database auxiliary field. So, but it's saying, let's see. Simple database doesn't have a file name, but simple database, simple IO ASCII file name. So we need to walk down the hierarchy here. Let's start up at time dependent and let's go all the way that far and do help components. So it has an IO handler. That's the simple IO ASCII. So instead of directly assigning the file name to the simple spatial database, it has its own IO handler. And so help properties. And indeed, uh, it's so it, we're not getting that information. Simple, I ask. Yeah, I think it's tripping up before it can get there. So, but what I see is that this guy right here, we need to insert IO handler in there. And we run it again. Well, we got past configuration. Okay, what do you know? We're now verifying compatibility of the problem configuration. So now it's sort of the second stage of error checking. I see a runtime error. Cannot find Lagrange multiplier fault subfield in solution field for fault implementation in uh, component splay. So our particular fault is looking for the Lagrange multiplier in the solution field, it doesn't find it. So let's go back to our parameter files. Now we should, uh, now we're in step six. Let's see, step six. We're looking for our parameter file, there it is. I want to see, uh, that was run. Let's make sure that this is a current one. So let's, let's just for sake, remove everything in the output directory and make sure that we're actually looking at our current. Uh, so we do have a parameter file. It's the only thing out there. So let's load it in. Let's collapse everything. Let's walk down from the top. So I go to problem. Let's go to solution. Ah, I have a solution displacement object of subfields displacement. I don't have a Lagrange multiplier. So I have the wrong solution uh, container here. My solution is a solution displacement is not what I'd use for a fault, which is solution solution displacement Lagrange. So let's look in my parameter file here. Uh, step six, where do I have that? It's usually at the top. 
I don't see it. So where am I in my solution? Let's click on the solution field. So I am, that's where it is. I want the name of the component. There it is, the full path is that. So I want path at problem. Uh, that's my header. And I want to set solution equals. So let's bring up, oops, sorry about that. We need to be over here in our components. Uh, let's find the components for the solution displacement Lagrange. Displacement. Solution displacement Lagrange, there it is. Here's its full name. So let's just copy and paste it. And you can see here it has both a displacement and Lagrange uh, multiplier fault. And so boom. So now if we run, Initializing, so we got farther along. All right, let's see what we have here. So we were initializing problem with the quasi-static formulation. We get a trace back, runtime error. So error occurred while reading spatial beta file fault underscore slip dot spatial db. Read data for three out of four points. So we better look and our fault slip spatial db file. Uh, I see three points. So it read, whoops, it read those three. It was looking for four. So I'll assume that I actually, since I have three locations, let's just assume that uh, we need to set the number of locations equal to three, that that's the error. Um, this looks like it's, doing what it should be doing. We're talking about uh, a slip distribution. So looks like I have uniform values that then taper to zero. Um, so let's see here. Let's run, keep running. See if we get farther. Okay, now our error message is down here. Could not find value final slip underscore slip underscore opening in spatial database fault rupture for main fault. Available values are final dash slip dash left opening, final dash slip dash opening, initiation dash time. So this is what our, our sort of our syntax was in pilot version two. We switched to underscore to have a one-to-one -one correspondence between our output uh, fields and our spatial database fields. So we switched to using underscores. So I need to change all of these dashes to underscores. And let's see if that gets us farther. Well, we're solving. Whoa, whoa. Uh, we, got, we got a lot of errors here, so we got to scroll way back up to the top. Uh, we got a segmentation fault. That's not good. And um, it's in the solve. Let's see, I'm trying to find 
if there's any other information in here that we're missing. Uh, okay, well, um, I don't see much useful information here, but uh, we can at least look and see what was written in our output. Um, so we got a bunch of info files. And so let's see what, let's start looking at some info files here for, um, and I'm just going to speed the process along. Let's look at our fault info files, uh, load them up into pair of you. Uh, so where are we? we're in troubleshooting output step six, two faults. Look, let's look at slab info. Oh, that's, I meant the splay, not the slab. We wanted the fault. Uh, splay info. And we also want the main fault. So step zero six, two faults info. Oh boy. So this doesn't look right. Let me adjust some, let's switch to where we're in 2D, so our wireframe, let's make the line width like four. Switch it to uh, change from surface to wireframe so we can get the line width of four. Let's make the display um, nice bright green. And so here's a problem. Our splay fault is crossing our main fault. It's got this little, uh, oops, come back here. It's got this kink. So this is definitely a problem. Um, and what we want is we first, when we have a fault intersection, we need to first create the main fault and then add in the splay fault. So let's look at our parameter file. Go back to fault step so six. Let's see here. So we first want the main fault, then the display fault. So our faults are in the wrong order. We need the, the one that goes farther, the one that, the one that ends in the T has to come after the one that it's intersecting. Uh, okay. So let's see if that resolves this problem in the solver. Who knows what was happening in, this, in the, what the topology of the mesh really looked like when you had crossing faults. Clearly a problem there. Uh, still getting a segmentation fault. Uh, so let's see, let's look at Let's look at our notes. Uh, I may have missed something in a previous. So we updated that. We fixed that. Uh, we have uh, fixed that. We fixed that. We did those. Aha, uh -huh. we have a different opinion here in terms of the error message we were expecting and the error message that we're getting. Uh, and so that was the error we had. So we fixed that. And so we're getting, we're getting a slight different behavior here. This may be a result of running in debug mode versus optimized mode. Um, in any case, um, 
Let's look again at our faults. It's got to be related to our faults. So let's delete. Let's load our faults in again. So fault info. Maybe we didn't. Something might still be wrong here. Looking at the display fault. Okay, let's. Change our surfaces to wireframe. Let's do make them really thick here. And we'll change our splay fault. Let's change it back to green again so we can see it. And let's see, let's zoom in. And I do still see a problem here. If you look at this intersection, let's make this one 12. You'll see the splay fault is being aligned with our main fault right here. So we're not terminating our splay fault correctly. It should stop here, but it continues one. So it looks like probably one cell too long. So this is a buried edge. So I need to make sure that I've actually marked the buried edge here because it should have stopped a fault here, but it's for some reason it extended one cell farther. So that's an indication that the buried edge isn't being uh, inserted correctly. So let's go back to our parameter faults. Let's see our faults. And for our fault, we don't, I don't see any buried edges, and our splay, I don't see any buried edges. So we need to add in the fact that we have a buried edge. Uh, I don't know what that one is. Uh, oops, and it's not label value. It's got to be edge value. Edge equals, I think it's display end and edge value. So we need to look at our GMesh file. Oops. You'll open up the tools visibility. Okay, what did I call it? Splay. So it is fault. Fault end is 20, the label value is 21. Splay end is 23. So 21 and 23. So go back here. This is 21 and 23. So let's see if that resolves. Oh, I need to exit out of GMesh. Let's see if that resolves this. Oh, now uh, let's see. End value. Oh, I have a typo there. Edge value and should be edge. Initializing. Solving. Well, looks like we converged. All right. So maybe we're done. We better look at the results. So reset. Okay, let's do sim equals one step zero six to false. Run displacement warp. Uh, we wanted, let's do field component equals x. Reset. It was showing the magnitude of displacement. I don't want. 
uh, I want. There we are. Okay, this is looking good. Let's go to the 2D, zoom in. Okay. So it looks like things are looking pretty good. One thing I do notice is that I wanted uniform slip and then I wanted it to linearly taper. And if I zoom in here, I don't, it looks like the slip is ending really abruptly right here. I was expecting the slip to continue down a bit further. So let's look at our slip distribution. So output step six, false, not the info, but I want the final value. Apply. I need to change to wireframe, make it nice and thick. And let's plot the slip. Whoa, that's so I see a slip of two up here, and then all of a sudden it drops to zero. So there's something wrong. Uh, it's not doing a linear interpolation of my slip between my points. It's just going. So if I look at my spatial database file, let's get back to the spatial database file. I should have seen here, we're going, we're supposed to go over five kilometers. We're supposed to drop the slip and uh, it just did it all of a sudden. So let's look at our parameters. Let's load in our parameters again and see what's going on here. So let's reload. Uh, collapse all, we need problem. Where's our interface? There's our interfaces. Here's our fault. Here's our database auxiliary field. Whoops. So it doesn't. Oh, earthquake ruptures. There's my rupture. There's my, this is the right database auxiliary field. So Fault rupture from a mean fault, query type nearest. Aha. So it's not doing linear interpolation, it's just doing the nearest. So it's just, it's going to have an abrupt transition as we saw. So I want linear interpolation. So where am I? This information is, is in step 06, line 67, uh, or down about 69, actually. So step 06, let's go down to 69. Earthquake. Step 06, two faults. Here's my auxiliary field. Database auxiliary field. Um, oh, dot, uh, what was it? Query type equals linear. We didn't need this for our uniform database because it's just uniform. Uh, but when we have a linear variation, uh, we need a linear variation. We need to use linear interpolation. So let's see what happens now. Oh, more issues. OK. Now we didn't even get past initialization, which uh, just shows that when you use nearest interpolation, it's always going to find a value because it just finds the nearest point. Um, Can not find values for initiation time at, we're down at uh, minus 29 kilometers in our fault rupture for main fault. So our slip database, uh, the fault goes down to like minus 29 kilometers and we only gave values down to minus 25. So um, what we're supposed to do, is, let's look up here at our comments, slip two meters reverse if we're above 20 and then increases linearly from zero at minus 30 to y at minus 20. Um, so we wanted to taper this over 30. Let's just, I don't know what the bottom of the fault is. 
So let's go to minus. Let's make sure there's plenty of buffer down there. So now we have how many points do we have? One, two, three, four. So we actually have four locations. And so remember way back at the beginning of this, we had a number of locations here to four and we actually do want four points. So we probably guessed the wrong fix way back when. Let's see if this fixes everything. Good night volume values for initiation time at minus 29. Oh, that's interesting. So we still have a problem in our spatial database too. So we have three values, left lateral, fault open initiation time. Those are the names, those are the units. We have four locations. Our data dimension is two, space dimension two. Data dimension, but we got we only have points along a line. So the data dimension isn't two, the data dimension should be one. Uh, so even if we have a 2D default, if we're giving points along a line, then we want the data dimension to be one, not two. Let's see if that is what the problem is. So it looks like that got us past the initialization, doing the solve. We converged. That's always good. Ah, so we ran. Let's look at the result again. Look at pair view. Let's reset. All right. Let's run our displacement warp script again. Uh, zoom in in 2D. Uh, looks like, notice how the how our, our displacement is smoother through here. And I can see, because I've exaggerated things, I can see that I have slip continuing down there. And let's just verify that by loading up a slip file. So we were two faults, faults. Apply, we need wireframes so we can see our line. Let's make it nice and thick. We'll go up to 15, make it really thick. Show the slip. Ah, look at that. So now we have a nice smooth transition here. Uh, we can change, the, let's see, I think if I remember correctly. I want to choose, let's choose the Inferno. There we go. Now you can sort of see it better. I have uniform slip up here at the top, and then I have a nice linear taper in the slip down here at the bottom. And that's what I want. Um, so let's uh, close that. There we go. So it looks like everything ran. And looking at my results, it looks like I'm getting what I expected to. So let's go back to our slides. Uh, yeah, we added in the ends. We ran. It ran. There we go. You can see again how we had that abrupt transition in our slip. That was what we didn't want. So we added in the linear, uh, we saw that. And we changed our data dimensions, then that's what we look like. All right, so we fixed all the errors in this. You can see how errors in the spatial database uh, affect the solution. And just because the simulation ran, you know, it uses whatever was in the spatial database and all the other parameter files. So you have to check to make sure that uh, 
scrutinize your solution to make sure you're actually getting what you expect. And um, you have to really sort of, in some cases, it can be a uh, sort of a perplexing error message. You have to look and sort of say, well, we know the gravity works, so we know the problem can't be in the pilot app.file. Now we're using faults, so it must be really defaults because we really didn't change anything else. Um, so you sort of sometimes have to back up, get something that works, then slowly increment uh, the complexity of your simulation to find out exactly where you're introducing the error. Um, in most cases, we had pretty good error messages that really directed us uh, to what the problem is. Um, these issues related to the inserting the faults, uh, you really, it's very difficult to sort of within the code detect some of those errors because you really don't know what the user wants. Um, and so uh, what we can, uh, what we have to do is we have to basically look at the output and see what we're getting and try and diagnose it that way. Um, this concludes our troubleshooting tutorial. Uh, this tutorial specific to example is not yet covered in the manual. We'll be adding that in the next month or so, but we have this video, we have the slides online to help you diagnose uh, your problems um, should you encounter uh, errors like these.